In this example, we're going to show how gravitation behaves inside of a solid sphere. This is typically applied to a problem dealing with a planet. Um, however, especially with Earth and other examples, we know that the density is not uniform throughout, but we're making that assumption. It's a pretty significant assumption. First, we've already dealt uh, with uh, dealing, you know, we've dealt with problems that have an object at the surface of some mass m. And uh, we've dealt with the acceleration and the force there, as well as above the surface. But what happens now when we're beneath the surface of the planet? I've divided this solid sphere into different pieces. We can see here in the dark gray area that we have some sort of a shell. If we assume for a second that it was hollow, and I looked at some arbitrary point inside that hollow uh, shell, let's call that point X. I could say that the net gravitational interaction is due to the sum of the individual gravitational interactions with the infinite number of points that I could draw uh, throughout that shell. So if I were just to, to kind of show the gravitational interactions with those little points that I've drawn in the shell here, we can see that there's a bunch of vectors pointing up and slightly to the left and slightly to the right. But there are also points down here on the bottom of the shell, and there are many more of them. Since they're further away, the, the vectors have uh, smaller magnitudes, and so I should draw them a bit smaller. But there are more of them. And so we can say then that the net effect of all of those tiny little gravitational interactions is equal to zero, and that's called the shell theorem. We're going to spend more time with that when we study electrostatics in a few more weeks uh, in the course. But for now, let's assume that the shell theorem says that the gravity at point Q has nothing to do with the shell around it and only has to do with the interaction of the mass inside this kind of inner sphere, if you will. We start this problem off with a density equivalency. We say that a density is equal to mass over volume, the mass of the entire planet, divided by the volume of the entire planet, which is 4 thirds pi big R cubed. And we can say that that's also equal to the mass inside the planet. The density is assumed uniform, and therefore that would be equal to 4 thirds pi little r cubed. I'm going to do this in two steps. You could do it in fewer, but I'm going to multiply both sides by 4 thirds pi. I get density is equal to 4 thirds pi uh, is equal to mass over big r cubed, which is equal to the mass inside over little r cubed. Now I'm going to multiply everything by little r cubed, and that becomes density times 4 thirds pi little r cubed is equal to mass times little r cubed over big r cubed. That's equal to mass inside. The reason that I did those steps is so that I could arrive at this equivalency now. I have an expression for mass inside. It's equal to both of these things, but we're going to pay attention to this. It's equal to the mass of the entire planet times the cube of the little, uh, the smaller radial distance r divided by the cube of the radius of the entire planet. Then I'm going to take that expression for mass inside and I'm going to plug it into a standard Newton Newton's law of gravity uh, formula. That's equal to uh, Fg is equal to big G times mass inside times the mass of some arbitrary object you know, at point Q, divided by r squared. This is just Newton's second law. Now I'm going to take this expression for mass inside and plug it in there. So that gives me Fg is equal to G times m, that hasn't changed, over r squared. And now I have to add the pieces that I substituted. That's equal to the mass of the entire planet times r cubed over big r cubed. And when I do that, I can see that the r squared in the denominator cancels out with two of these three r's, so I still have an r here. And now I can rewrite this expression as fg is equal to g times big M, the mass of the planet, times little m, divided by big R cubed times r. And the reason that I kind of drew this in a different color is because everything that I've drawn in pink, that I've now bracketed in, is a constant. 
G is a constant, big M is a constant, little m is a constant, and R cubed is a constant. And so basically I can also write this expression as Fg is equal to Kr, where uh, K is just, it looks like Hooke's Law, it's not, but it has the same form. I've actually even seen the negative sign placed in front of the K to show that the direction of the force of gravity in R uh, as a displacement vector are in opposite directions. Nonetheless, you just need to know that it's a linear relationship. So what that means is if I were to descend into the planet and the gravity at the surface for some arbitrary object, let's call it Earth, and let's say that the mass was 10 kilograms, let's use 10 for G, so we can say that the weight is 100 newtons at the surface. And then I could say that at two-thirds of the way away from the center, or one-third into the planet, we could say that the weight was 67 newtons, because there is a linear relationship between R and the force of gravity. And we could also say that at some point, let's call that point Z, which was one quarter away from the center of the circle, we could say that the weight of the object, or the force of gravity, would be 25 newtons at this arbitrary point two.